Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Shredology, episode three. Um, so far on the show we've talked about Stoke and how it is spread through community and also how it is fostered within oneself and found through the means of finding ease on your skateboard and finding your niche. Um, Stoke is something that's really important in downhill skateboarding. Um, without it, there wouldn't be downhill skateboarding. Um, the thing that keeps people coming back is Stoke. And the thing that keeps the people pushing that is community. And uh, I, I am a real big believer of community being powerful and amazing and epic in downhill skating. And uh, that's today's topic. We're gonna talk a little bit about community. But first, Kind of want to give you guys a little update on uh, myself. Um, I recently scored some Valkyrie MK3 Boxsters, which are pretty sick. They uh, come with an adjustable back base plate, which has some pretty cool features. You can switch between uh, 15 to 40 degrees uh, using um, a wrench and a, a bolt, which goes through this little sprocket that has three holes. And uh, it's pretty easy, pretty cool. Um, I was riding it on my Comet Orbiter at a local favorite the other day, and uh, was getting a little bit too sandy with it. Ended up high siding on a toe side slide, and uh, I wasn't going too fast, luckily, but I smacked my dome pretty good, and uh, luckily I had a Predator helmet on, which is hard foam. Um, first time really smacking my head pretty good, and I uh, got a little concussed, so I wasn't able to do the podcast at the normal time. Um, but feeling a little better today, so I'm going to try to give a crack at it. For this episode, I uh, got to give big ups to uh, Ty Visser and uh, Justin Dubois for uh, being an inspiration of uh, some of the knowledge that I gained to uh, do this episode, and also uh, Casey Morrow and uh, David Fingerbang Rogers. Big ups to those dudes for giving me some insight into the PDX downhill community. Um, so without further ado, let's get into it. Community. Community is awesome. It's something that you can find in almost any extreme sport you do. There's always like gonna be a community for it because it's a niche and uh, people find that they are most comfortable in these niches. But uh, I think there's something special about the downhill community. For uh, the past 20 years or so, the downhill skateboarding community has just kind of been on the come up. It's just such an awesome and entertaining community to be a part of. I think it's really special and it's really strong. There's some things about downhill skating that make it so. Uh, for one, the idea of progression and uh, dreaming of what's possible has always been a driving force for downhill skateboarding. People are always trying to push each other and they're trying to push what they can do on skateboard and uh, make new skate events happen. And that's all they really want to do. They don't really have too big of dreams, but when it comes to skateboarding, they just want to bring the best out in each other. So it keeps us going. As long as there's room to progress, they're going to keep doing it. Like the downhill skateboarding community has its own members throwing in their events. There's rare cases where they bring in outside forces like Red Bull or shit, local townships to come in and throw events for them. But really they're just self-driven to make their own events happen. And, uh, that's pretty unique. And also, it's super welcoming. And the idea of building the community is what they are driven to do. They just want to bring more people into it because that's really where their goals lie and what gives them the, the future that they know they want. The more people they bring in, the more opportunity it has to grow and bring in unique ideas. And uh, I'm gonna try to get into that today a little bit. Community of downhill skateboarding is kind of supported by a few things I like to call the pillars of community. Like I said before, progression, the drive to get better and to get sponsored. People are out there always pushing their limits to skate bigger hills and skate faster and see what is possible on a skateboard, like bringing a slalom board to Mary Hill or riding a slalom board in downhill races and just finding that new line, that new maneuverability, seeing what the human body is capable of. People have always been at the forefront of uh, skateboarding through media 
and uh, when they can see their progression in videos and chase people's progression in videos, that's just kind of what keeps them coming back for more. Also, the soaked out community leaders who just want more people to skate with and see more people skate. There are these like people that are just burning so bright with stoke that they will go out of their way to invite people off the street they see on skateboards to come to their events. Like uh, case in point, Bryson Striker Lions and uh, the coast longboarding scene, when he was trying to build that community, he just wanted to see people skate. He wanted to see gnarly shit. So he would go up to people on the street with a notebook and ask for their name and number and ask if it was okay for him to hit them up about events and sessions and pretty much help build coast longboarding from the ground up just by hitting the streets. People like that who just want to see progression and radness on a skateboard with a lot of people, those guys are huge for the community. And, uh, you know, honestly, without them, we wouldn't be where we're at today. And also you can't deny that uh, events and media makers are also what help drive community and keep it floating up up there in the stoke clouds. Um, media makers are showing the world what their skaters can do. They're uh, sharing the stoke. They're showcasing events to get people from elsewhere to come and support it and also get sponsors to come and support skaters in the local scene, which that stokes people out. And then uh, event organizers are putting on these events and putting out their blood, sweat, and tears, and even personal dollars to make these things happen just so they can see people skate and have fun. Like, perfect example, JP Rowan of Rip City Skate used his own dollar to make Kathlamet Corral happen. And what started out in the first year with 30 people ended up in like five or six years with 300 people coming to each event. And uh, got people who didn't really give a crap about downhill skateboarding racing to give a crap, and then the rest is history. Chasing Stoke is a huge part of community as well. Um, especially in downhill skateboarding, we're always trying to get a little bit more stoked and uh, we're pretty much willing to go anywhere for it. Um, the cool thing about the downhill skateboarding community's individual members is that they like to throw outlaw races. They like to go to outlaw races. They like to go out in the boonies without hay bales with maybe some people watching corners and radios and just bust out laps and race out in the woods. Like uh, we have one here in the Portland that I throw called the Sizzle Dizzle Outlaw, Roll the Dice Outlaw. We go out there with a couple cars, a couple uh, heavy duty radios, and shut down the road for about three to four hours and just get as many runs as possible and get people racing on the hills. And uh, you know, people live for that shit. And it's super rad to see that you can make a race happen without much of anything, just a little bit of grit and money. Yeah, progression. People love to progress on skateboards and uh, people love to see their own community get sponsored. When a person in your community gets sponsored, it gets the community fired up because that's like, whoa, the whole world's looking at us or the industry's looking at us, that's awesome. So you can't deny that progression leads to sponsorship and gets people to want to be sponsored and progress themselves. And uh, even if they don't give a crap about sponsorship, they're still out there pushing their limits and skating with the big dogs because they want to do that. They want to skate with the people who are pushing the limits and have fun with those people because that's a lot of fun for some people. And also, like, can we just say that the downhill skate community is super rad because they're super open and welcoming to skaters and they want people to come and skate with them. Like they're willing to pick up people off the streets who they've never met before, invite them out to sessions, and then get in a car with them and drive across the country to go to a skate event that might have 20 people show up. Like the bonds that downhill skaters create are so strong. I myself have never really felt more strong community connections than I have in the downhill skateboarding community. And that's what keeps me coming back for more skate with some people four or five times, and now I'm probably going to be lifelong friends with them. And that's pretty awesome. So, uh, yeah, those are kind of like my opening thoughts on the community of downhill skating. That's why I think it's rad. And, uh, yeah, you can kind of see that in events. If you ever go to the Mary Hill Rats Free Rides or Tepe Tacos or Giant's Head, um, you'll see all those things I mentioned and super stoked, super rad. Go to Ditch Slap. <laughs> the community is cool. But how do you build a community? Like, how do you get a community to become 
something that is special and huge. Like we all know what's happened. Like you can look at certain communities that have existed for a long time now and seen how they've been successful. Like Coast Longboarding, PDX Downhill, the Sunset Sliders Crew, Mids, NCDH, the Texas Crew is killing it. Hawaiians are killing it. Like what makes these these crews have success? Well, first and foremost is of course it's skaters. I'll talk about for some examples here. The Mary Hill Rats. These people would go and hike Mary Hill, which is a famous road in the in uh, Goldendale, Washington. They'd hike 10 runs a day and just have a great freaking time hiking this road, cutting corners. It has some of the best turns in the world. Sam Hill built this road. He wanted some really cool place to brap his car, and it was the first road paved west of the Mississippi. But the Mary Hill Rats wanted to do more. These skaters have made Mary Hill Rats free rides happen three times a year for as many years as I can even remember. I don't even know how long, but a long time. Each event, they have U-Hauls going up and down Mary Hill Loops Road all day long for two and sometimes three days, and usually have a turnout of about 250 people. And they've made this super spectacular event where people can just come out, hang out, skate this epic road, take huge pack runs with like, 40, 50 people sometimes, and just have a really sweet time. Uh, Mary Hill Rats are killing it, and they're just skaters who wanted to make something awesome and accessible for the community, and they've done a really sick job. Uh, big ups to the Mary Hill Rats. The Sunset Sliders have done a lot for skateboarding. Um, they had some of the most styly, sick shredders in downhill it's ever, that we've ever seen. And uh, Big Dave and Dougie Fresh and Aaron from the block and Byron and Liam and Shredwell and all these other dudes, Josh Torres with Bay Sessions, they wanted to show what was up and they made sick media. They showed the world how rad downhill skateboarding could be by just ripping together and making sick videos. Like you can look at a lot, a lot of the early uh, caliber videos, a lot of the early Comet videos, ABEC 11 videos, wheelbase magazine videos. These guys were out there throwing it down and showing what downhill skateboarding could be and how much fun it could be. And it's honestly getting people stoked out on it. That, that shit made you want to go skate and they did a huge thing with the community. Coast longboarding with the uh, coast longboarding tapes that Concrete Wave used to put out. And uh, flat spot longboards with uh, their highway jams and their outlaw races, the Coast Outlaw Series, um, Mike Benda doing Saturday sessions, getting people out in the streets, skating together, local sponsors hooking people up for days. The Coast Longboarding community is so strong that, as Chase Johnson said, it's unbreakable. And they've laid such a good foundation that no matter what happens, anybody can pick it up and bring their own unique flavor and taste to the scene there and just make it as good as it's ever been. And it continues to be as good as it's ever been thanks to uh, Flat Spot Longboard, which is like a longboarder owned shop that has been putting in so much work for the community, like giving people places to live, throwing tech slide Tuesdays, taking people in buses to different spots all throughout Vancouver area, just to skate Rad Hills and serving up pizza. Just epic. Also, around uh, Kamloops, British Columbia, there's the uh, Kamloops Longboard Club, and this dude named Patrick Mutri with the Kamloops Longboard Club was just trying to get the downhill skaters a safe place to practice and give beginners and, and newbies like a safe place to skate so that they didn't get hit by cars or have to deal with traffic. And uh, they put in the work and they had a little bit of uh, contacts with the people in the uh, sports and recreation department, and they built the first downhill longboarding skate park. That's amazing. That is so sick. They even go to do weekly sessions and slide clinics and uh, also do the Skate Sun Peaks event, which is, is like closing down a go-kart track. That's a downhill go-kart track at a resort and they have a ski lift that takes back up to the top. Kamloops, Patrick Mutri, killing it. Also, you ever heard of Central Mass? Uh, yeah, Mike Gerard. yeah. They've been throwing this event for 10 years they were uh, 
basically making a entry level downhill race for people of all riding abilities to come and shred over the years just gained such a cult following that people from all over the country would come and just throw down some of the heaviest lines and uh yeah mike gerard just made this super rad event that was open to everybody and single-handedly kind of made skateboarding a lifestyle for a lot of people with this event and uh it was super rad to see uh, I never got to go myself, unfortunately, but just based on the videos, it looked like a real sweet time. So uh, big ups to those dudes, skaters. Skaters are out there putting in the effort, and uh, they're definitely keeping the torch lit. It's awesome. Let's talk about skate shops. Well, a lot of people think skate shops are kind of not important anymore, you know? Like, you can do direct-to-consumer sales, and uh, what's up with skate shops? Like, you know, personally, I've never really had any skate shops that were super like chill and cool and epic to hang out with around my own location, but I've heard of some ep epic ones and I've even gone as far to see as some putting on events and throwing sessions. And like I said, Flat Spot Longboard Shop is like hosting skaters and sheltered and fed. Let's talk about skate shops. I think they're also a pillar of the community. Um, Motion Board Shop out of Seattle. They've been killing it for a while now. They've just been so good with customer service and have shown what's up with longboarding, like how to do it properly. They've had how-to videos, awesome gear reviews. Um, Nate Blackburn has been killing it there for years. They were throwing events like Boomtown with the help of Ethan Cochard and Ross Druckery. Killing it, so good. They had Triple Crown of Downhill events, Slug Wars, um, lots of slide jams. And they're just really helpful and informative and they continue to be so and are really just about helping skaters out. And that's fucking awesome to see. Nate, you're killing it, bud. Um, Mearscape out of San Diego. Mearscape has been killing the customer support game for a while now. Um, it's a skate shop owned and run by skateboarders that bleed and sweat skateboarding. Some of the most helpful people in the industry working at this shop have been super helpful in getting people set up on their right boards and their right setups. They've done a lot of how-to videos with some top pros which have turned out really good and been helpful for a lot of people to learn new tricks. And also, they've thrown some events with a, which have shown some of the biggest turnouts I've ever seen, like the downhill disco in which they closed down this little water pump access road and put a bunch of jumps, a slalom course, and people just shred it all day long for like two, three days. And then they have a fat party in the warehouse with a big half pipe, a funk band, kegs. This is just some real good quality shit. They're basically just supporting skaters for the fact that they can, and they want skateboarding to thrive, and they're killing it. They've been doing events like the Turkey Slide Jam, been helping out with Barrett Junction, and like I said, just excellent community involvement from Mere Skate. Rip City Skate, rest in peace. But Rip City Skate was super sick. It was a Portland-based skate shop that had its doors open to all the skaters, whether you skated street, skated downhill, or an LDP kid. People would go to this skate shop and hang out before sessions and just vibe out with the people that worked there. It was a real family-oriented kind of skate shop. And uh, from the legends I've heard, it was just a super awesome, welcoming, warm place to be. JP Rowan was uh, killing it there. He was throwing the Switchback series off his own dime, in which they would have a race on these paths in Portland called Switchbacks, which were just perfectly paved, big hairpin after hairpin after hairpin, perfect for beginners to learn how to slide and corner, and also really good for racers to kind of dial in their technical lines. Yeah. These Switchback Series events would have 50 to 60 people show up. Sometimes people from all over the world would show up. They had one Switchback Series that took place right after the Mary Hill Festival of Speed. So you've got legends and racers coming into this local little path and just blowing kids' minds. Like all these little kids and locals get to come to this path. They usually skate all the time and just see some of their favorite skaters shredding with them. Like that's something unique and uh, Rip City Skate was killing on that front. They also threw the Cat Lamb at Corral. Let's talk about that real quick. 
that was an event where it was basically shutting down the town of Cath um, which is a small kind of port town on the Columbia River in Washington. They would have this race on this entry level hill with a couple slides and people from all over Washington and the West Coast would come down to it and just watch their favorite skaters and racers racing on this hill. People like James Kelly, Kevin Reimer, Patrick Switzer, Louis Poloni. People would just come to this race and throw down. And the first year they had maybe 30 people show up. And the second year they went hard. They did a, uh, a mule kicker giant launch ramp, uh, a sidewalk showdown slalom race. They had a slalom course there too, a push race and a border cross race and a slope style event. And over the years, they just put more and more effort into it and built these super epic ramps on the course. So if you're going down this pretty mediocre hill, but now you've got spines made of giant quarter pipes. You've got kick ramps, you've got roller ramps, you've got all this sick stuff to do. And then you get to just see these longboarders shine by throwing down six slides and radical 360s off these jumps. And it got pretty heavy. I got a chance to go to two of them and I saw some of the craziest skating I've ever seen there. Yeah, it's just something unique that you don't really get very often And Rip City Skate killed it on that front. Flat Spot Longboard Shop. I've mentioned them a couple times already. They were just dedicated owners supporting skaters, uh, Misha Chandler and Les Robertson. They're just giving people what they needed. They gave people uh, wheel lathing services. Um, they did the highway jams, like I said where they would take people out in buses to shred these hills and have videos and sponsors and really just like showcase the talent in Vancouver. And yeah, they were really just taking advantage of their hills and giving people an inclusive venue to shred and throw down and really just feel like they were supported by their skate shop. And uh, that's a really unique thing. They were killing it. They also do auctions on Facebook Live now, which is pretty cool. You can buy some really cool shit. Uh, cheap prices and actually auction for it. It's pretty unique. I've done a lot. They were throwing down at the uh, Salt Spring Slasher event, which I got to go to. They provided food for all the racers. It's cooking hot dogs all day on the course while people race their brains out in the super gnarly hill at Salt Spring Island. Fly spot longboard shop. Can't say enough about them. Now that we've talked about skaters and skate shops, let's talk about the thing which people don't really like to talk about very often, but it's super important, media makers. That's right, media. It's one of the th pillars of the community. Without media, you wouldn't have the option to look into the downhill skateboarding world and uh, figure out what was good and what's going on and where the stakes are. We definitely talked about media a lot in the uh, last episode, but uh, I'm gonna talk about some of the media makers this time that killed it and continue to kill it. We've got Skatehouse Media. Skatehouse Media was the sickest thing. It was this website run by skaters living in a skate house. They just started uploading their clips of their skating every day for the whole world to see. They would put out videos after videos and blog posts after blog posts and how to's and really just like give people consistent content of epic shit they wanted to see down on skating. And uh, Louis Poloni, James Kelly, Max Dubler, Brian Peck, Cody Noble, they were all killing it in the skate house back in the day. And they did it for a long time. I think if you talk to any downhill skater who's been in it for a while, they will tell you great things about Skatehouse Media. And uh, who knows, maybe one day they'll come back. They definitely pushed the game. Made people stoked out on downhill skating more than more than any other media company I can think of. And there were just a bunch of skaters living in a skate house with GoPros. You can do it too. You can't not talk about sponsored skaters and uh, you know the companies that support them. Back when downhill skating was kind of just getting its wings. It did this really cool thing and started putting out videos that were similar to like skate companies like Baker and Creature and Plan B. They were just putting out sick parts of their skaters. Arbor putting out videos of Cody Noble and Max Myers. Paris putting out videos of Ethan Cochard, Brian Peck. You know, Lanyot's putting out the get in the van videos. Sector 9 was also killing it. Today, S1's killing it. They're putting out raw runs of some of the best free riders in the game on some of the most iconic locations. Pal Peralta's killing it, putting out some epic videos as well of some like Cindy skaters. 
yeah, without these videos, people would probably not be as stoked on skating and we're lucky to have them. So, you know, go get sponsored, throw down some sick videos, stoke people out. They'll be very thankful. But, you know, can't have these without the photographers and the videographers. The people who are out there on the corner, sweating in the heat, driving the car behind you, making sure we get the clips so that the world can see. Without these people, we wouldn't be here. And uh, gotta give big ups to all the photographers and videographers out there. Just a couple of them which I'm really, really thankful for and have really shown me the inside scoop of the downhill skating community, which I really appreciate, is uh, John Huey. He was killing it with Skate Slate. Pretty much anywhere you've seen a video or photograph of any skate event in the past 10 years, chances are John Huey had some part. He's been to events all over the world and he's been writing sick blogs and posting rad photos for the longest time and uh, hope he continues to do it. Doug York with the Sunset Sliders. He was out there filming for the Sunset Sliders, getting the word out about style and grace. He's filming the uh, Sunset Sliders scramble, helped film some of the wheelbase magazine videos. He was just showing the world what was up. He was there, camera in hand, put in the work. Alex Amin. Whew. Can we talk about Alex Amin for a second? Alex Amin was pushing what was possible for filming downhill skating. When you look at the follow car filming of how it is today, you can kind of give inspiration to Alex Amin. He was up on people's asses with a car, maybe like three feet from them as they're careening down a hill on their skateboard and using a wide angle lens. So you've got this skater staring into the void. The peripherals are all blurry. The skater's in perfect focus. And Alex is just careening down this hill with this skater, like, whew. He made some of the sickest media I've ever seen. And a lot of the videos I saw of him, I was like, damn, like this dude is filming like a maniac. But I watched every single one of his videos and I don't think anyone's done it as good as Alex Amin. And uh, you know, big ups to him for giving downhill skating a new, a new way of being interpreted and looked at for all of us. Tyler Topping. He's out there these days taking photographs of all your favorite skate events. He's been working with Skate Slate for a while too now. Tyler, you're killing it. He's getting some real crispy, sick photos. If you see Tyler, give him a big old high five. Aaron Breitwar has been killing it for a while too. Uh, he put out some work with uh, a couple other skaters in a magazine called Downgrade Magazine, DGM for short. Photo work for Skate Slate and uh, other companies for a long time now, since he was like, 16 or 17 still continues to do so um dude's a wizard with the camera and he's definitely given us a really cool unique look at the environment and the skaters and how we kind of interpret that environment pretty sweet matt kenzel on board photography and videography dude's a wizard he made a lot of the skatehouse media videos edited a lot of the skatehouse media videos he was capable of riding downhill filming the skaters send it and keeping up with them like a big steady cam on a skateboard like holding it turning around filming getting those angles Matt Kinsel's a wizard dude's insane uh Les Robertson uh he's been helping with skate slate for a long time uh he's pretty much the dude uh giving us all those super sweet articles about skate events giving us a good look into the skateboarding world Downhill skating is uh, a lot better for it. Skate Slate, super sick. Course Concrete Wave, Wheelbase Mag, Marcus Bandy as well. Nowadays, we got Jake Ballantyne with Homie Skate. Uh, if you've seen any like stick videos of any of the Vancouver Shredders, chances are Homie Skate is probably uh, partially involved in that. Jake Ballantyne, you're killing it right now, dude. I uh, really enjoy watching your videos and you're really bringing like that nice like flair that just like makes you feel good and want to go skate. So uh, yeah, Jake Valentine's killing it on the media right now. Uh, Turner Williams with Boarding Media. Dude is uh, getting some fucking bangers, I'm telling you. He's been going on world tours with some of the top skaters and uh, skating with some super sick events with like rad skaters as well and just filming everything. Like dude's on a mission to get clips and it's awesome. Uh, go check out Boarding Media. They've got some really good videos on their YouTube. 
And uh, also Spud with Linked Media. He's been killing on the filming as well. Uh, getting a lot of videos out for S1. Just showing a lot of skaters that, yeah, we're still doing it. We're still out there getting it. We're still out there filming it. We're still killing it on downhill skating. Like, you know, it might be taking a little break and a lull. But, hey, media's still coming in. Spud's been killing it, putting in work. So, yeah. That is what I call it the community pillars. Without those, community kind of suffers. And with those, it flourishes. Why don't we talk about some communities that have killed it and uh, how they killed it. In 2010, around then, something happened. Like overnight, everyone just bought longboards. And suddenly, downhill skating was super popular and almost all the cities that were havens for it, that had hills all over the world. Um, you saw the LA scene blow up. You saw Portland scene blow up. You saw the uh, Vancouver scene really blow up. Colorado, uh, Massachusetts, hills were being found. Progression was just starting to flourish. I think at the core of all of this was the communities. The communities were out there making this progression happen and the community members were doing it, doing it big. Let's talk about Colorado. I recently chatted with Ty Visser, who was a uh, community organizer and leader in the Colorado scene in about 2009 through 2011. I was talking with him and he was telling me that there was kind of a couple things going on in the early days of the Colorado scene blooming that was really uh, getting people hyped. One was that there was a uh, University of Northern Colorado Longboard Club and uh, with a couple members, Joel Putra, Chris LaGrace, Richard Chang, and Ty himself, they were just trying to like skate all these new hills and progress and like, you know, push all the people on the boards. But you know, not much was happening. Just longboarders pushing around, maybe topping at about 20 miles an hour. Justin Dubois was talking with the members of the club and told him that the city and the scene was ready for outlaw races. So Joel, being the stoked out individual that he was, thought it'd be a great idea to throw an outlaw race and uh, basically put his head down and said, hey, Ty, you should do this. So Ty, who was Stoke Master Supreme, decided, hell yeah, I don't know how to do this, but I'm gonna make it happen. So he held one of the first races in Northern Colorado's outlaw series and uh, made a silverfish account and just uh, spread the word. $1 buy-in, winner, winner take all. It was in the uh, Denver Boulder area and you just wanted to see what would happen. Probably about 10, 13 people showed up to the race. And uh, some of the people that showed up were uh, Zach Madem, Calvin Staub, and uh, Joel himself. And uh, so it began. It wasn't really much. It was just uh, a lot of people who were just trying to survive, get down the hill. But then you had Zach and Calvin put on their leathers, Justin Dubois as well and they just wanted to be each other. Like they weren't gonna have it. Like they weren't gonna let someone beat them. And uh, thus kind of ignited the Colorado rivalry of uh, I gotta be faster than that guy down a hill. And um, this is kind of what sparked it all. Sure, everyone just wanted to skate and have a good time and see people skate. Ty was doing that, but also people wanted to race and just prove they were faster than everyone else. After the first event turned out pretty cool, Joel decided to throw a race at a hill known as Overlook, which uh, is a pretty famous hill for racing. It now holds the uh, anything but a skateboard race and also the ye old winter outlaw. And in this race, 55 or something people showed up. Uh, thanks to Silverfish, they were getting the word out there and uh, all the Northern Colorado kids who wanted to race and see a new hill and get stoked out came through. Another person showed up, which kind of made shit a little bit... Uh, Interesting. Coop, the legend. Coop showed up. Kevin Cooper. Now this guy is pretty well known as uh, the pastor of Speed Church today. And uh, also Pagans of High Country. I'm sure you've heard of that. This is the guy who owns the big like camp compound up in the, the high country and um, has everyone just kind of like stay at his house when they come through town and skate all these super sick hills. Uh, so he shows up to this race. It just goes off. 
his energy just comes through and gets everyone super hyped and stoked to, to skate. And then uh, that's kind of where it all popped off. Justin Dubois, Brent Dubendorf, Zach Madem, Coop, Calvin, just started wanting to skate fastest hills. They just wanted to like check mark things off the bucket list of hills that could skate. And uh, while that was going on on the personal front, Ty was out there throwing events. Joel and Richard were out there setting up a skateboard company called Deity Skateboards. Deity Skateboards would later become Sanctum Skateboards. So the Northern Colorado Outlet Series is going off. People are just like coming to these hills that Ty and Joel are finding and being like, this would be sick for a race. This would be sick for a race. And they're just coming to these races and throwing down. These outlaws are having like maybe 60 people attend at a time. And Zach is just on a hot one. He's winning every race. Just like he's there to win until the very last one. <laughs> Joel came out and basically cut off his lead. Zach won every race in the Northern Colorado Outlet Series except the last one. I'm sure that pissed him off. That was it. That was the beginning. The next year, Northern Colorado Outlaw Series came back with four races hosted by Ty and then Joel with Deity threw his own four races. And then Justin Dubois, he threw the uh, Buffalo Build Downhill, which drew in pros and legends from all over the world. And uh, that just, was basically like a do what you want, shutting down this road, skate with your homies, have fun, get as many laps as possible. And that was kind of the uh, the antithesis of the Colorado event organizing scene. Um, Buffalo Bill Downhill happened for a couple of years. A helicopter crashed at Buffalo Bill Downhill and they were still allowed to come back and race the next year. Like that's kind of what was the vibe in these races. Just do what you want, anything goes, we're making it happen. It's going to happen. We're on fire. They were on fire. Uh, after Buffalo Bill downhill stopped, Pikes Peak downhill came through. And then a couple years later, Justin Rolo decided to bring, bring it back with the Devil's Peak downhill. So for as long as the Colorado scene's been popping off, they've been pushing each other to go faster, skate gnarlier roads, and throw sick events for the community. Justin Rolo and the squad threw Buff uh, Devil's Peak for a couple years. And uh, I never got to go, but according to a lot of my friends and people who did go, it was one of the six events just focused on runs, big tie at the top, yelling racers ready as loud as you possibly could to get people fired up. That's what it needs, you know? It just needs people who want to get people fired up and skate, see new spots, push their limits, skate with their friends, and just have a real good time with the community. I was talking to Ty. He was telling me that he just wanted to hold events that were on anyone can skate this hills. He just wanted to show the community new spots and skate new spots. And that's kind of what he did. And he did it consistently. He did maybe one race every couple weeks with his friend's help. That's important. He says, we need enough community leaders to find hills that we can close and have annual events on and enough community for those events to run without new people. Then we need a way to get new people to make those events worthwhile enough to create sponsorship opportunities and drive sales for the industry to create even more. The people need a race. The people need a slide jam. The people are thirsty for it. Next community of topic, PDX Downhill. People started getting longboards in Portland. Things were kind of popping off up in Seattle, down in Salem with Longboard Larry, Peter Mitchell, Eric Hovey, John Huey, Casey Morrow, JP, Rowan, Billy Bones Miners, Robin McGurk, Ethan Cochard, Ross Druckery. Pretty much the whole Pacific Northwest had little communities popping off that people were coming out of the woodwork to come skate and just find a place to skate with people. And uh, Rip City Skate was kind of at the core of all this. It was a skate shop that was really set on getting people to skate. JP opened this shop. JP wanted to get people longboarding and he wanted to get rad companies into people's hands. So he was pretty much opening his doors to skaters to come hang out and be a part of the community. He built a skate ramp in his shop, hooked up riders all over the area, through the Switchback series, and through Kathlamet Corral. All of doing this is tax write-offs for his shop. Can you imagine that? Putting your heart and soul so much in downhill skateboarding that you're making events for your community happen and writing it off as a company expense. Like that's dedication. Smart. So skaters were getting really into it 
Robin McGurk was throwing like Mount Tabor slalom races and also doing slide clinics, community college. Casey and JP and John were doing videos of uh, safety sessions with John Huey, Safety Huey, and also throwing races on pretty gnarly roads. Races were happening frequently. There was a time when races were happening like once every other week. Switchbacks being a sanctioned race, Kath Lamont being a sanctioned race, Mount Tabor Downhill Challenge being a sanctioned race. So what popped all this off? Like what, what, how did it start? Well, I was chatting with the dudes and they said, the housing crisis of 2008 had a lot to do with it. All these hills were being paved to build rich neighborhoods on, but the housing market crashed. So basically these roads were just left without anyone living on them out in the wilds to be found and skated. They would throw events on them. They'd go find a hill and wouldn't have any problems throwing outlaw races or outlaw slide jams on. And they had enough people to make it happen safely. They had enough people to corner watch. They had enough people to spot. They had people to shuttle. They really utilized each other's uh, intrinsic value to put in work and make it work. And with that, people started to become really good friends. They just wanted to skate together. In the winter, they would go skate skate parks and skate garages. And in the summer, they'd skate hills all day. And they'd just invite people out. And after a while, with that tight crew, they decided they wanted to start traveling. So they went to Danger Bay. They went to Sullivan Challenge. They went down to LA. They went to the end of the world tour in Santa Barbara. And they got to skate with all these people who they were kind of friends with and also competitors with. A lot of them were racers, so they would go to races and race with all their friends. And then when the race season was kind of off, they'd go and session hills in Malibu and stuff. So this kind of got the communities connected. Portland became connected with Vancouver. Portland became connected with LA. And LA became connected with Vancouver. Skating was becoming really, really legit. Um, videos started coming out of Liam Morgan busting out massive stand-up slides. And skaters started to want to progress to that level. People really got into stand-up sliding. People really got into racing. People were coming out of the woodwork and taking on the IDGSA or IGSA. Skaters were coming out, going to races, competing for world tours, really just taking it pretty seriously, but not really. Just really wanting to like be a part of that lifestyle. They wanted to go to events and see their friends. They wanted to go party and then race the next day. They were just about it. Rad media was coming out like I was. People were getting fired up. Boomtown was going down. And they were throwing slide jams all up and down the West Coast, like from Eugene to Seattle. Boomtown slide jams were happening, popping off. Probably like 80 to 100 people showing up at each slide jam. You can check out some of those videos in the links below. Um, also, one of the things that kind of drew people to the Portland area was uh, Mary Hill. And like I said before, the Mary Hill Festival speed race was going down. And right after that, JP threw a switchback series race, which got people to be kind of more intricately connected to the community. And uh, that just got people to understand that like, you know what, fuck trying to like fantasize about going and skating these places and meeting these people and skating with these people. I'm just gonna go do it. And that's what they did. They just decided to go on skate trips and go skate these places they thought about and go skate with the people who they met at Mary Hill and Switchback Series. I was talking with Fingerbang, David Rogers, and I was asking him like, what was going on that was making the community so epic. Like what was what was really going on? And he told me that people just wanted to have friends and skate with their friends. And there was like a perpetuation of skill and progression that people wanted. Everyone was super welcoming and it was a very comforting community. People started to skate house. They skated everything, skate park, garages, hills, racing. People were just down to skate and they weren't afraid of their limits. They weren't doubting themselves. They were just completely all in to try it and see what happened. And it worked out for them. Sponsors started picking people up. Billy Bones got sponsored by Rain. Arbor came in and sponsored Casey Morrow and uh, Brennan Tisson and Fingerbang was getting flowed by Arbor when he was young. And then eventually he ended up picking up Landos as a sponsor. You know, just all this attention comes to the local skaters in the community. and. That just stokes people out, you know? It gets people fired up. People were killing it and they were just about it. And that's a lifestyle, you know? They chose to live that life and really just not think what could happen, but just make it a reality. So 
What can we do now to make it go forward from here? Well, we can learn from our predecessors, you know, find new spots, share them with people, host races and slide jams on them. You want to give people the rush of skating a new spot, invite them out to new hills and skating, racing and slide jamming and all that shit is a good way to do that. You can find a hill, close it down and invite everybody out, have a good time. Just use communication with people, use radios, have spotters, make it as safe as possible and uh, just do your thing. Don't think what could happen in a negative way. Just think of it's going to work. Positive. Positive mind frame goes a long way. It's going to work. Give it a shot. You know, also, we need to get more people into skating. Uh, we need to make skating more accessible again. There's a longboard family group on Facebook and a longboard discord, but I think people are really missing forum style silverfish kind of stuff, you know? Forums where people can go in, look up information about what they want to learn, look up their sessions and their spots in their local areas, meet people to skate with. It's kind of hard in like a randomized forum group, like a Facebook group. So we need to have a little bit more, I guess, uh, a pinpointed system where we can go in there, be able to search exactly what we're looking for and find people who are already there talking about it. Uh, I think a forum like Silverfish could really work and uh, really just takes someone to make one. If anyone's got forum building skills and website building skills, I'm looking at you. Also, we need to make more rad videos. We need to stoke people out on our scene skating and share them with the community from all over. And hopefully sponsors will look at your crew and check you out and then maybe flow you guys some boards and wheels. And that's really gonna stoke out the community, you know? Having someone in your community who's flowed or sponsored really just makes that fire brighter and uh, shows that like, yo, we've got sponsor attention on our crew. I need to go shred harder. I need to participate more and it'll happen. I was talking to Chase Johnson from uh, the Coast Longboarding community and he said he didn't really have much experience throwing races, but luckily Coast Longboarding had a rich history of events to choose from. So when people stopped throwing races, it kind of left a gap of what needed to be filled. So Chase stood up and took on some old races to throw. He uh, pretty much revived some old events like the Coast Outlaw series. Um, you know, it's good to have people come in and put their own take and individuality into the community. And you can do that by reviving old events and just making them happen again. Just because you're redoing something that happened before doesn't mean it's not gonna take on a new life of its own. So, you know, coordinate with your community, offer up ideas, talk, talk, uh, talk within each other's circles and just put ideas out there, you know, and help people be confident enough to make them happen like Joel did with Ty. Yeah. Um, back to what I was saying about the people needing a race and they needing a slide jam. People need events. The people need a Mary Hill Rats free ride. The people need a Tepe and Tacos. The people need a Giant's Head free ride. People need these events to, to have something to go to. So, you know, big ups to Kevin Reimer and the Mary Hill Rats and uh, Devon Cox and the Land Yachts people for throwing Giant's Head. People need these events. Big ups to Daddy's Board Shop and Robin McGirt for picking up Mount Tabor Downhill Challenge and keeping that rolling. It's been really good fun and you know people are always looking forward to going back. I know I am. So I guess I'm gonna kind of end the show with this. Legends need to exist. There needs to be those that help great events happen and make those communities great. And when you go out of your way to make an event go down or make some media or do something that is a little bit harder to do than just going out and skating by yourself or going out and skating with your normal crew, it's gonna pay off in the long run. If you put in a little bit of work, use a little bit of ingenuity, and just try to make something cool happen, it's gonna pay off. It might not be grandiose like you had in your head, but it's better than nothing, and it's gonna be something. Nothing amazing was ever made with the intent to be amazing. It was just made with the intent of happening. Kathlamic Corral started out with 30 people, ended up with 300 plus. And it was a super sick hill, super sick event, 
super slick ramps. There's a will, there's a way. You can make downhill skate parks happen. You can make super stylized crews become the norm of what style is on a skateboard and show the world what that looks like. You can make a website that puts out videos every day to show what you and your crew is getting up to or what the rest of the crew is getting up to or the world. You can do these things. They're within your means. It's happened before, it can happen again. But that's not where it ends. There's a lot more communities to talk about. Coast longboarding, sunset sliders, mids, NCDH. There's so much more and so much more to make happen. So that's where I leave you guys. Thanks for joining me on episode three of Shredthology. This is Kurt, signing off. Peace.